Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us for today's CITI program webinar. Today's topic is race in clinical research, ethics and IRB decision-making and is presented by Nicole Strand. Just a few quick notes. This webinar will be recorded and the recording will be available on the CITI program's website. This webinar is also for educational purposes only. It is not designed to provide legal advice or legal guidance. You should consult with your organization's attorneys if you have questions or concerns about the relevant laws and regulations that may be discussed in this webinar. In addition, the views expressed in the webinar are solely those of the presenter. Now, let me tell you about today's presenter. Nicole K. Strand is Assistant Director for Research at the Center for Urban Bioethics. As well as Assistant Professor, Professor Strand's current interests are in structural determinants of health, racism, health equity, advocacy, and cultural change. And now I'm going to pass the mic to you, Nicole. So my objectives today, um, and hopefully we can get through this in 45 minutes, are going to be to explain First of all, why race should not be used as a proxy for biology in primarily clinical research, which is what we'll mostly be focusing on. I'm also going to apply the lessons of VITAL um, to studies that come to your IRB. And if you haven't heard of VITAL before, um, you're going to be excited to learn this story today. And then finally, I'm going to close by trying to trace the root causes of some of these stark health disparities that we see across racial lines, including sociocultural forces, structural racism, and trauma. And I certainly won't have time um, to go into all of those reasons, but I think what I really want to do is dispel the notion that race has anything to do with biology. And so we will start with objective one, which I'm calling race-based medicine. So before we get to research, we have to talk about the fact that race is embedded in how medicine is practiced. And so we have to go back in time and sort of trace how, how did we get here? And we have to remember that just like anything else in clinical medicine, things can feel very cemented, but nothing is really set in stone. And as more research comes to light that refutes the evidence that we currently have, we change clinical practices all the time. But right now, race as a biological concept is used all the time in medicine. And as somebody who teaches in a medical school, and I know I'm sure many of you do as well, I can tell you that it's still very much being taught to our own medical students in 2021. So depending on your job and your position and where you're situated, you might be more or less familiar with the ways that race is embedded into clinical decision-making. I'll go through a few examples here, but suffice it to say, we use race as a factor to make diagnostic decisions, treatment decisions, and even to change algorithms for what lab results are telling us. And so hopefully I've sort of convinced you a little bit that we're wasting our time at the very least um, using race in clinical medicine because it's not working and it's a poor proxy. But the question then becomes, how did we get here? How did clinical medicine even decide to start using race um, in their clinical decision-making in the first place? Um, and so that's where I'm gonna tell you the story of VITAL, which is the first race-based drug but before we get to Vital, I want to take an even further step back. How did we get this idea at all that race is correlated with biology or genetics? How is it that it's taken us this long to start to reverse um, that assumption? What is the origin? And I'm really interested in this. What's the origin of the belief that Black people have a higher muscle mass or a smaller lung capacity? Because that idea about um, the reason the reason we think that we uh, we should adjust people's uh, GFR because their kidney function is likely different actually comes from an old myth that black people have a higher muscle mass. And the idea that we should adjust the lung capacity machine, the spirometry machine, comes from an old idea that black people have a smaller lung capacity. And it won't shock you to learn, like most of our beliefs about race, that they were born out of racism. In fact, if there's one thing I want you to hold on to that's most particularly strong about this topic and that really sort of shocks our worldview, it's that we have this sense that in our world, race is a naturally occurring thing and that racism is the terrible consequence of this naturally occurring thing. But I actually wanna challenge us to think about whether it might be the other way around, which is to say we have this terrible thing in our world and in our culture of really focused in-group and out-group dynamics and of wanting to justify making classes of people less than other classes of people. And that thing is called racism. And racism actually caused the concept of race. And I know that's, that's really wild and shocking, but hear me out. 
So as early as Thomas Jefferson. So um, Jay Cohn, who's a researcher in the 1970s, he has this idea, he has this brilliant idea that he's gonna combine these two drugs. Um, they're both generic drugs that are already on the market and I'm not gonna try to pronounce them, but I'm gonna call them H and I. So these are the two chemical structures for the H drug and the I drug. And he has this great idea that if he combines these two drugs, he's gonna be able to really help with heart failure, which was a big problem at the time. And there was at that time, no first line treatment. And so he's in the 1970s, he has this idea, he's gonna create a new vasodilator by, com by combining these two drugs, H and I. And he does his first trial and he does his first trial in veterans. So this trial is called the Veterans uh, Heart Failure Trial. So the VHEFT, uh, trial number one. And this uh, trial is very simply designed. It's, it's comparing the HI combo, which is his new drug, versus placebo. Uh, the sample size in total is 459 people. And what I have circled on the slide, and I want you to watch as we continue with these slides, is how many Black patients were in the trial. So he recruits this number of veterans. He's able to get 49 Black people in a trial. Not that he's trying intentionally hard to get numbers of Black people in a trial. It's actually, at this point, not at all relevant to him, the race of the people. But just so we know, because it's going to come in, come in handy later. There are 459 people total, 49 total Black patients. And HI works, so he's excited about that. But then time passes. And so what research should we do? Am I saying... Am I saying that race should not have any role in our research? Um, I want to emphatically say no, I am not saying that. But what I think we need to ask whenever a protocol comes across our desk or comes to our institution that is asking a question about race, I think we need to ask, is it being used as a proxy for a genetic or biological marker that we don't understand? Or is it being understood as a social category that may involve a number of influences and factors? We don't wanna blind ourselves to the fact that it is true that different races of people in our country have vastly different health outcomes. But we need to understand that we can never assume that that is because of race, um, or that, that that is because of a genetics or biology. We should know that it is because of something else. And that could be multifactorial. It could be a combination of many other things. And so just to sort of conclude with this, I think what we need to do is we need to be mindful of history. We need to be mindful of the slippage that can happen between biology and social construction. And whenever we see race being used in clinical research, we should know about this history and we should know what we mean and what we are invoking when we use racial variables. And I think our institutions should examine our policies related to using race in research. Um, you know, again, as a person who sits on the IRB, I see these protocols in isolation, just like the examples I gave you. And I'm the policy, essentially, right? So I'm the policy at our institution on what we do with regard to these race-based protocols in the sense that I try to push and sway the IRB to see this in the way I think it needs to be seen. But there's no policy written down that says we, sh we here at our university use race as a variable in these ways, and we do not use race as a variable in these ways. And that's the kind of thing I think we need to start moving towards. Now that we understand race much better than we did 20 years ago, we need to start to integrate that into the way we practice medicine and into the way we practice research. So thank you very much. Um, and um, these are a couple of references for you to check out, um, and especially um, these areas of further reading, I think, are, are really excellent if you're um, interested in a deeper dive into some of the topics I talked about today. We invite everyone to review our content offerings regularly as we continue are continually adding new courses and webinars in various areas of technology, higher ed, research, ethics, compliance, and professional development. And that concludes our webinar. Have a great day.